Joining us right now, Katie McFarland, Fox News National Security Analyst. By the way, in Washington, D.C. today for a forum. Oh, it, 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 yeah. Stop, stop so right in Washington. there. Katie is in KT Washington, D.C. McFarland today. is in Washington. That's what it says right here. Yeah. And she in is Washington, not DC. here to say hello no, to us this not. morning. No, Wow. Katie. Thank you, know someone. Uh, look, I'm two blocks from the White House, guys. <laughs> we'll be right over. Uh, anyway, she's today there's a forum at the uh, National Archives moderating a discussion about President Nixon's historic opening to China. And what a great day to have that conversation as our current commander in chief is in that same nation uh, following in Nixon's footsteps. Why don't you compare and contrast for a moment, KT McFarland? Well, in, um, when Nixon went to China 42 years ago, no American of any significance had been to China in over a generation. So it was the first time an American president had gone as a president, and it was a huge trip. It was one of the first big-time summit meetings. It was done on primetime television, and it was the first glimpse any Americans had had of China in well over two decades because China had been closed to the U.S. for that period of time. So it was historic. It was groundbreaking. Um, it was met with enormous enthusiasm in both China and the United States, and it was probably the biggest strategic game-changer of the century uh, because what the United States managed to do in, the, in, in what was referred to by Nixon as well as others as the week that changed the world, Nixon was able to take China out of the Soviet orbit, out of the alliance with the Soviet Union, and put them into an alliance with the United States. It was the major event of the last 40 years. Now, fast forward today, what's happening and rather than a third world country, which is what China was when Nixon went, Obama's there, and he's being treated like a lame duck president of a has-been nation. Every stop he makes, um, the, the newspaper and the media in China is referring to the United States as a declining power, a country that's on the wane. Obama is a weak leader, um, having just had a drubbing at the polls from his own people. Um, so the significance is, is pretty profound when you see the contrast. And it's not just because of what China's done, but it's what the United States has not done in the last several years. And, and President Obama, I think, foolishly, instead of standing up to it and challenging the Chinese, is being conciliatory and being nice and talking about the great accomplishments, when what he ought to do is look at them in the face and say, you guys want to steal our technology? You want to steal our technology from the defense industries? And while I am here, unveil a new fighter, stealth fighter, based on American technology that you've stolen? What an Guess insult what? that is. Yeah. What an insult. What a humiliation. We have moves of our own. You're terrified about your people having access to the World Wide Web and reading things like the New York Times and open and free media. We can make that happen in China because we do know how to manipulate the Internet. Well, so anyway, I think that we should talk much tougher to them in public and in private. Well, and, and then there's this. I mean, uh, U.S. and China have announced uh, some climate uh, goals, uh, some climate change goals. And, and the U.S. has decided that they will cut emissions between 26 and 28 percent uh, below 200 and, uh, 2005 levels by 2025. You say, well, that's pretty aggressive. Here's what the Chinese have agreed to do. Well, we're going to peak our, our, our emissions somewhere at 2030 if we can. It's like we give these very concrete goals. We just say, well, here's what we're going to do. And then we turn to China and say, and China? And they go, yeah, we'll try. We'll think about it. Uh, and, and the sad thing is that the United States will keep its commitments, and the Chinese will, you know, they'll sort of fudge here and there. And the, the promise that Xi Jinping made was that the Chinese will slow the amount of coal plants they're producing, and then they may halt them, and then they may reverse them, but it'll be sometime well distant in the future. So, in effect, they've agreed to nothing, and we've agreed to everything. Um, what the president should have done with regard to energy was make the announcement, hey, new sheriff in town, here's what we're going to do. The United States has the ability to be self-sufficient in oil and natural gas within probably two years. We are going to accelerate our efforts to do that. Once we have, we have become self-sufficient and our manufacturing has recovered, we are going to push down the price of oil for the whole world. That bankrupts Russia. By the way, you're at that conference, Putin. It makes things very difficult for the Middle East. And China, if you want cheap American energy, you better be really nice to us because otherwise we're not going to facilitate the export to China. 
Uh, meanwhile, Vladimir Putin uh, is uh, raising some eyebrows from amongst the Chinese media and amongst many of the dignitaries there. They weren't really thrilled with his uh, making moves, apparently making moves. <laughs> um, the first lady of China, the video was pretty funny to watch, but everyone sort of like, uh, you know, uh, 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 aghast at, at him doing this. But th again, with Vladimir Putin, everything's kind of for show and a power play, isn't it? This this plays very yeah, well at I home. Mean, you've got you got to just sort of chuckle. What happened was they were in an outdoor stadium, and the world leaders were all in the front row. While President Obama was sitting next to Xi Jinping, the Chinese president, they were chatting away three, row, three sort of seats down. The first lady of China was sitting next to Vladimir Putin. And you can see from the video, you don't have the you don't hear the video but you can see it. They're leaning towards each other and she's probably saying something like, Gee, it's really cold outside. So Putin, without missing a beat, reaches back to his coat, puts it over her shoulders. Yeah. And smiles grinningly. Yeah. Well, none of none of which being noticed by Obama, by her husband, et cetera, but being captured by the cameras and went going viral yeah. in China. She very graciously kept it on for maybe five seconds and then handed the coat Putin's coat over to an aide and took another coat of her own. But, uh, boy, it, what a smooth, fast move he did. Well, in, in international diplomatic settings, I mean, this is it's, it's something fun to talk about, but th these images really do resonate at home for Putin, don't they? I mean, they love this stuff in Russia. Oh, they do. I mean, the Putin, we laugh when we see pictures of Putin riding bare-chested on a, a horse in Siberia or swimming in the lakes. Um, the lake, cold, frigid lake in Dublin, or, you know, kissing a fish that he's just caught. But the, the Russian people just love it. They just, they think that shows that they're, they have a tough, manly leader who is the tougher and manlier, and now, after yesterday, more suave and charming than any other leader in the well, world. Well, that's what we need in this country. We need some fish kissers leading our country. That's... Well, I don't know about that, <laughs> but it certainly plays with the Russians. All right, listen, KT McFarland, thank you so much. Always a pleasure to have you with us, and welcome to Washington. Thank you very much. It's a strange town. <laughs> it is. Well, we live here. We 